wherever you can be, including our guest, Taylor McCarg, former Rice quarterback and college football analyst, joins us. And Taylor uh, texts Paul, texts me uh, with his comments last week about Texas and the rest of the Big 12. I guess you found out that we do have an audience, right, Taylor? Oh, I knew you guys had an audience, man. I got cooked all week for saying it was going to be a, a, a – I don't remember exactly what I said, but I will clarify. <laughs> um, let let me clarify. Yeah, but in all seriousness, I mean, the Big 12, you've got two teams at the top, and, I, and I'm really I'm basing all of this off of uh, people a lot smarter than me talking about Vegas with where they've got these season win totals at right now. And – in my opinion, you've got Texas and Oklahoma both sitting at nine and a half. I don't think Oklahoma is a 10 win team, although their schedule is pretty light. And then you've got Texas who I've been on record saying, I think that's your, your best shot out of the big 12 at the college football playoff. And I think they've got a real chance at it this year. But then after that, you just have a lot of teams in the big 12 that are stacked somewhere between six and eight wins. Again, in terms of what Vegas has them put out at now, to talk out of both sides of my mouth, TCU last year, I don't think anybody, certainly I didn't have them making the run that they did. And there's always the chance that a, you know, a Texas Tech could be that dark horse that pops up or an Oklahoma takes more of a step than, than I have them taking. And they end up with an 11 or maybe even a 12 win type of season. But with where things are penciled right now with the number of guys that are coming back at places like Oklahoma State that traditionally is a little better than another win total right now sitting at six and a half. It just feels like you've got a lot of parity in sort of the middle, sort of to the upper middle of the conference. And then to me, you've got Texas that is, is a distance away at the top of the conference. So uh, I still am probably going to get uh, even more hate after this from, from the Baylor Bears fans. But you know what? I, I would do the same thing if I was a fan. No, it's, hey, don't, yeah, be who you are. And it's, it's, there's a lot of question marks there, and if they answer them, great. Good for them. They did a couple of years ago and surprised a lot of people. Taylor McCark with us every Thursday at 4.30 on 365 Sports. So, Taylor, um, since you've, you've completely eviscerated all the Big 12 fans and they don't love you anymore, uh, what's your favorite conference now? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I guess, it, you know, I guess I could say the ACC since they uh... – really are epitomizing the Atlantic Coast Conference with adding potentially two teams from the Bay Area. And it looks like this, uh, from everything that I've seen today, I'm sure you guys are following along as well, the, the ACC may, in fact, add Cal, Stanford, and SMU, with SMU giving up their uh, television revenue and covering those costs themselves for the first seven years, which is just insane. Uh, but in this landscape of college football, it's honestly whatever – uh, you know, last year, if you could have thrown out an idea that just seemed the most far-fetched, it seems like those are the things that are actually starting to happen now. Taylor, I know that uh, there's there's more than just one game to choose from this weekend, and um, I mean, there's a handful of them, but what are your thoughts on getting to see, you know, Notre Dame and Navy kick things off? Sam Hartman, obviously a big addition for the Irish in the offseason. We'll get to see Caleb Williams later that night. Just what are maybe a couple of your thoughts on this opening weekend that's the unofficial opening weekend, if you will? Yeah, for, for Notre Dame, obviously, they had such a slow start last year and would expect uh, in Freeman's second year that, that certainly they're more improved with Sam Hartman transferring in at the quarterback position. I think their wide receiver room will be better. So the first crack, you know, really as a fan, you're just hoping that some of these games are competitive. There's some there's some pretty wide uh, margins here in terms of the lines. But for, for Notre Dame and Navy, obviously really exciting right out of the gate. I'm – I've got a handful of Conference USA games with CBS this year, so I'll really be paying attention to UTEP against Jacksonville State, Jacksonville State bumping up to FBS, uh, looking you know towards the end of this plate, FIU going to Louisiana Tech. Those are some of the ones that I'll be really paying attention to. And then also, of course, uh, I'll be watching Caleb Williams and USC like everybody else. You want to hopefully see them take a step forward on the defensive side. We know what that offense is capable of and what Caleb Williams can do, but – I think for USC, the biggest thing is you really would love to see them put the clamps down on uh, San Jose State, and and at least in the first half, if you pull the starters and they score some points in the second half, you're not as worried about that. But, uh, man, that was one of the worst defenses in the country last year, and for USC, again, really hope that they've taken that step forward on that side of the ball. Is there, uh, other than uh, an injury, and maybe if they get on the wrong side of a couple of scores, the odds that Caleb Williams will not repeat like an Archie Griffin, and some have not, some good ones, but repeat as the Heisman Trophy winner with all the numbers he'll probably put up? 
yeah, I think there's a reason that he is, if he's not the favorite, he's in the top two uh, in virtually every poll that I've seen. And some of it has to do with uh, what you just talked about with what they put on tape last year, just how talented he is. And, and uh, again, we're excluding an injury. But there's been plenty of Heisman winners in the past that um, you never know the reasons why. Sometimes they e- either regress or they just don't have those Heisman moments. And that's sometimes – Players don't get the benefit of the doubt if their defense lets them down. And Caleb Williams, if USC doesn't take a step forward like we've talked about on defense and they go get two or three losses and they're out of the the race for the college football playoff, I think that's where it's most likely that you would see him fall out of contention to win the Heisman, where maybe it's not even his fault, but they drop games in conference they shouldn't have because they didn't get things sorted on the defensive side. And, you know, there there are plenty of examples of excellent players that – but turned into usually it's a quarterback award on one of the best teams in college football. Honestly, one of the outliers here is, is Robert Griffin. And we played them that year that he won it. That was a three loss team, but the fireworks that that team put up and that offense put up led by Robert Griffin made it so overwhelming that you had to give him the trophy. Yeah. And uh, of course the big win, Oklahoma, Oklahoma, um, so prime, uh, was that yeah, a primetime prime time, game? Yeah, it was yeah. a primetime game. Yep. Yeah, it was the you know yep. Aaron Andrews is here. All that stuff kind of all leads into that. Uh, a guy I I really like uh, when it comes to you know, maybe dark horse Heisman chances. Taylor is Sam Hartman at Notre Dame. Um, they play Navy uh, this weekend. Obviously, that's a rivalry game. Uh, it's in Ireland. It's going to be kind of wild. Do you think he can get the Irish in the playoff discussion? Is he that much better than what they've had the last few years? I think so, but again, Notre Dame, you're talking about a significant step forward when you go from what they put on tape last year to making the jump into the college football playoff this year, and they've got a challenging schedule. I mean, they've got a stretch right in the middle of the year. Looking at it right now, they've got Ohio State at Duke, which on paper doesn't look that challenging, but it is a road game, then at Louisville, and then back home against USC. That four-game stretch, you you, that schedule, it, it, it tends to be that Notre Dame plays year in and year out. You've got Clemson later in the year. It's really difficult. The one thing that Sam Hartman brings that Notre Dame hasn't had in a long time is that is one of the most accurate, if not the most accurate, long ball passer in the country. And that's one of the things they were so effective at at Wake Forest was 50-50 deep shot type of downfield passing game. He's one of the best. Again, if not the best, the only person that I would really put up there with him is Caleb Williams at USC, which we just talked about. I think Notre Dame, they certainly have enough marquee games where early in the schedule, just look at the the matchup against Ohio State on on the 23rd of September. If they win that game, you're talking about getting right up there into the top five, putting themselves in a position where they win out or even if they just have one loss. That's where I think you've got a chance for them to be a playoff team. And the last thing I'll add on that specific to that Ohio State game is what happens with the quarterback position? Because what you've seen and what we've read out of camp and and some of these uh, comments from scrimmages and practices is they haven't had anybody really separate themselves yet. And it's similar to what's going on in Alabama as well. But for Ohio State, if they can't get solid quarterback play early in the season, you've got Notre Dame coming early on the schedule. That's a really big matchup for both both of those teams. Taylor, putting you on the spot a little bit, but I'm sure you saw the top 25 rankings. Uh, if not either way, do you have your, your set of playoff teams ready to go to, to unveil here, or are you kind of in the midst of still trying to figure all that out? I thought about this. Uh, I probably should put pen to paper and come up with who my, who my top four would be. Uh, I'll put Georgia in right now just because I don't think their schedule uh, – there are not enough challenges – on paper right now, even though they're sorting through. I guess now they've named a quarterback, but I think there's still way too much talent there. Uh, I'll give USC the benefit of the doubt, I think, with the amount of talent they have coming back and their schedule. I would have – I was about to say SMU. USC going into the playoff. uh, Likely the winner of Ohio State or Michigan. I'll put Michigan there because I think they win that. And then I'll give you one, uh, again, that that Big 12 fans will – get fired up over but I do I would have Texas as that fourth team because I don't think they lose two games this season I think maybe they lose close to Alabama but uh, with the amount that they have coming back I'm, I'm drinking the Kool-Aid I've bought into the hype I would have Texas in the four spot I had this question uh, from somebody in the chat room Baylor played Rice it was a few years back 
and it's a massive stadium. We know it used to, you know, even hosted a Super Bowl. What was that like playing in such a massive, like a, a, a coliseum type with a, a school that does not have much uh, great school academically, but the fans aren't there that often? Yeah, it was challenging. I mean, I could give you a really long answer here, but I'll try to keep it short. We played a couple of big matchups for us at home where we played Houston or we played UCLA at home. Both of those games had, you know, north of 30,000 people, 35,000 people. And it just still didn't feel like a big atmosphere because the stadium was so big. And the new athletic director, Tommy McClellan, that, that Rice just hired, they're bringing in for Vanderbilt. I appreciated that in his opening remarks, he talked about, Rice needs to retrofit and make some serious improvements to that stadium, including the press box. And they've done certain things. They've added a new end zone facility. They've changed some things on the other side. But if you look at what I like to look, use Tulane as the example, uh, where we used to play them in the dome, in the Superdome, they now have, I believe it's Yulman, where it's 30-ish thousand people. And I think that's perfect yep. for a place like Rice. You don't need really any more than that. And I think it also surprises people the attendance that a lot of these, even Big 12 stadiums, what their capacity is. A lot of times it's still less than 50,000 and sometimes more around 40,000. And if, if that's a Big 12 stadium, Rice certainly doesn't need to be there because on our best day, biggest atmosphere, we never got more than 35,000 people. So uh, conference games, I can tell you when we weren't very good and we were playing Louisiana Tech at home at 11 a.m., we weren't anywhere close to 35,000 people. Taylor, uh, you obviously are very uh, knowledgeable and uh, part of the deal when it comes to the American. I mean, that's uh, it's your expertise, I think, if you will, uh, amongst many other things. But uh, how are you feeling about the race that's shaping up and just the, the new teams coming in? I mean, where are you kind of leaning? You got UTSA, who's obviously been an immensely impressive program, but SMU, Tulane, just how are you seeing it kind of break down in the American? Yeah, I think a lot has been made of, of Tulane. Obviously won a ton last year, beat USC in the Cotton Bowl. I think they'll be right there again this year. Their defense will not be as good this year as it was last year, but it's still Michael Pratt coming back at quarterback. They should still be solid. UTSA, you mentioned. The only other team that I would add that I, maybe doesn't get enough credit right now is SMU. I, I think what Rhett Lashley has built there and the transfers that they got in, a couple of which were from Miami, which is where he was previously, that's a really talented team. And we had SMU last year when Preston Stone came in as a backup and he broke his collarbone early. He was extremely impressive early before he got hurt. And I think there's a world where SMU actually has gotten better at that position over Tanner Mordecai and not gone backwards. Um, now, it remains to be seen, but I think there's a lot of talent on that team. If, if there was a third team that I would say really has a chance at winning that conference, it's SMU. And then behind that, uh, I do think there uh, there's going to be a couple year grace period for sort of the bottom of those Conference USA teams that moved up. Rice is going to need to add talent. I think UAB with Trent Dilfer, they they'll get there, but it's going to it won't happen this season. Charlotte obviously struggled lately, but the top of that conference, Tulane, UTSA, and I would put SMU. I think it's going to be a really competitive season for those three. Taylor, thank you. Don't open up your inbox, but thank you very much. We appreciate it. No, really, it's great, the reaction. You're telling us how you feel. That's what we want. And, yeah, uh, people are going to go up and down on that, but it's great that you uh, gave us your opinion. We appreciate that. No, oh, I, I appreciate it. I love it. You guys have awesome fans and really loyal listeners, and, and uh, I tell you guys all the time, but I love coming on with you guys. Taylor McCark, thank you. We love that you're with us uh, every Thursday around 430 with us on 365 Sports. Yeah, you just – 